Wassail. We previously left off our discussion with these charts showing how Old English vowels corresponded to Anglo-Saxon runes. This video will be looking at how to use this information as a guide for writing today's English as it sounds in runes. To avoid drowning you in complexity, for now we'll only examine British received pronunciation and the general American accent. As always, We'll be using Wells lexical sets as our guide words. First up, let's start with the trap vowel. Both accents agree on its sound, and there's already a rune for that sound, so why not use it? Lock in ash for the trap vowel. Next out of the bag is the goose vowel. The two accents disagree on its length, but otherwise recognize the same sound, and there's already a rune for it. Lock in oo for the goose vowel. For the dress vowel, there's some difference, but, if you remember, the rune e historically slid from an open mid-vowel in Proto-Germanic to a closed mid-vowel in Old English. Seeing its sound slide back isn't too much of a surprise. As practically everyone recognizes these sounds without a problem, I think we can keep e for the dress vowel. Any objections? Fourth. The father vowel presents us with the same length discrepancy as the goose vowel. Regardless, the Anglo-Saxons used arc for that sound, so lock it in. Now we have the comma vowel. Both accents use the schwa. This creates a problem for us because the Anglo-Saxons had no central vowels whatsoever. However, if we look at the path Ethel took as its sound developed, we find it at least hung around close to the center of the IPA vowel diagram. Its limited use in England also means that it is not so historically tied to any one particular sound as the other runes are. As such, while elevating one of the rarer runic vowels to a very common status might be controversial, all languages change over time, and just as the Anglo-Saxons didn't use this sound, so too they didn't use this rune so much. In that sense, they're a perfect pair. Next up, let's look at the thought vowel. Do you remember how we said in our prior video that ors is a rounded vowel? If not, here's that clip again. In others, it rounded and moved to fill the position vacated by Ethel that ended up caught in the tide as the open mid-vowels shifted to close mid-vowels, resulting in ors. Now just as e has shifted back down in the general American accent, the sound of ors has done the same at the back of the vowel space. But if this vowel is now in the position that Ethel started in, then why wouldn't we use it for that sound? If we were using Elder Futhark, then it would make sense to use this rune for that sound. But we're not. We're using the Anglo-Saxon Futhark. And to the Anglo-Saxons, a rounded back vowel was represented by Ors, not Ethel. Consequently, Ors is the logical choice for the thought vowel. Moving on to the foot vowel. Many of you will know that it historically branched from the goose vowel. Even their respective spellings in Latin script indicate that. Both British RP and General American say it the same way, so let's expand the realm of U to cover that sound too. At this point, I want to raise the problem of the three lexical sets present in the upper left quadrant of the diagram that is, the kit, fleece, and happy vowels. Those of you who have seen this channel's earliest videos will know that we previously took the approach of ignoring the happy vowel. Although that would seem to work, it renders void a distinction which in some accents becomes important. Consequently, we've rethought our approach. Do you remember how, in our video on Old English phonology, we said this. Having become squished between four other runes, it needed to escape. This sound later became known 
as unstable I. Significantly for our purposes, at one stage, in certain parts, it made the E sound, which is today used by many English speakers as the fleece vowel. In light of that, using EO for today's fleece vowel is a fully justifiable development. Well done to American Futharch for working that one out before anyone else. Meanwhile, just as the dress and thought vowels have become more open, thus shifting their runes down the vowel space, it's reasonable to suppose that the rune Is should have taken the same path. Therefore, the rational solution is to use it for the kit vowel. At this point, we need to make one small exception. As we mentioned in the Old English video, the diphthong used in the word near has historically been represented by the rune er. Following the trend as Old English developed into Middle English, it migrated up the vowel space while remaining a diphthong. It is important to retain that rune for the non-rhotic diphthong ear because in some dialects it's used in words like vehement and vehicle where nobody uses a rhotic vowel. Additionally, for dialects which distinguish the word Sirius from the star constellation Sirius, using this rune conveys the distinction. Given that even in some American accents this diphthong remains in use, it is important for it to remain written with this rune because writing it any other way would increase confusion across dialects. If your dialect does not have this diphthong, we'll elaborate upon when and why you might still want to use it in an upcoming video. Now for a more radical change. The rune which broke away from Ur by fronting might seem as though it no longer has a use in today's English, but that's no reason to abandon it entirely. Respecting how this rune represented a front vowel, and given its relation to Ur, it seems most befitting to use it for the mouth vowel rather than the goat vowel. This table is now out of space, but we have one vowel rune left to address, so let's do that. In both Britain and the Americas, the choice vowel is typically transcribed the same way in IPA. However, a variety of dialects slide it towards the fleece vowel rather than the kit vowel. Additionally, when a vowel immediately follows this diphthong, that final i sound frequently turns into a y. Consider the words sawyer and boyish as examples. Given the regular flexible nature of this sound, spelling regularity can be achieved by using a rune related to both the i vowel and the y consonant. That rune is the one we call your. You may remember that we also used it for yods in the consonant video. Again, that is because yods can make either sound in different dialects. So, how can you know when to use ye yeah and when to use your? Ask yourself, does the y sound occur at the start of a root word? For example, disunity would use ye yeah because the root word is unity. But whenever the y sound is not at the start of a root word, then use your. This way, we maintain the use of the full Anglo-Saxon rune row and give new learners a clue as to when words starting with y have taken a prefix. This same logic can be applied to the face vowel, which typically begins in the mid-front range around the dress vowel. The price vowel is a bit trickier because it usually begins around where the mouth diphthong does. Although a wide assortment of dialects begin the price diphthong in a more centralized position, and so would prefer to begin this vowel with arc, most of those are geographically proximate to dialects using the front vowel. Seeing that's the majority, and it makes more sense for people already familiar with IPA, 
I'm going to have to relinquish my personal preference on this one and admit that Ash Yor is the better transcription. Rune School, if you're watching, well done on that one, mate. This screen is now completely out of space. So, what do you think of these decisions so far? Are there any you disagree with? Tell us what you think in the comments. For the next video, we'll arrange these vowels in a new table so we can identify a rune for the happy vowel and add runes for the other remaining lexical sets. Thanks for watching. Thank you.